Um, I'll start off with an anecdote, if I may. I've got a, f a friend called Ben, and one of the reasons Ben's a friend is because he's uh, a close collaborator, and Ben would call himself a health economist. Um, ben has a young son, age seven, uh, Tom, and Tom's in school one day, he's primary school, and the teacher's going around the class, and they're asking uh, the kids what their parents do for a living, and one child says, oh, my daddy works on the trains, another... Another student uh, pupil says, oh, my, my mum's a doctor, and sh she gets to Tom, and Tom's a um, confident young man, but he's only seven years of age. He gets up and says to the class, oh, my dad, he's a healthy communist. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm neither a healthy communist nor a health economist. Uh, I'm an epidemiologist, and I'm interested in why some people get disease and why some people don't. I'm interested in why some people live longer than others and some people die prematurely. And we've become quite interested in recent years in, in the differentials in mortality between countries. David Porteous described differentials in mortality between two cities, Glasgow and Edinburgh. We see this on a larger basis between countries across Europe, um, comparing Great Britain, for instance, with Eastern Europe and Central Europe. But we also see it within the UK. And we've probably from the 80s, seen a increase in mortality um, in Scottish populations relative to English populations. We euphemistically call this excess mortality. So and in 1981, the year of the census, there was about a 5% uh, increased mortality in Scotland relative to England and Wales. Uh, Ten years later, there was marked increases, although stabilisation. And then most recently, there's around a 10% excess of mortality in Scotland relative to England and Wales. So these data are obviously very descriptive, and they only really become valuable if we can learn why these differentials exist. So what we've done, we've, when we've run a couple of projects, and I'm going to describe these projects very briefly to you, um, we've we tried to understand what's underpinning this difference in mortality patterns in folk born in Scotland, living in Scotland, and then folk born in, and living in, in England. And what we, what we know is there are stark differences in deprivation between England and Scotland. These are images of housing conditions uh, around the late 60s and early 70s. But it's also evident, quite interestingly, that these differentials in poverty, in socioeconomic status, as we like to call it, don't actually explain these differences in mortality rates. The rates, the, the data I just showed you took those into account. So if it's not the most obvious one of socioeconomic position, what, what could it be? And there are a whole range of possibilities here. It could be that health behaviors, which we've talked about today, smoking, drinking, diet, physical activity, it could be the genetic, genetic differentials. It could be that there's differences in obesity levels. And what we need are well-characterized studies to do this. So we've, we've looked at this in the first project. We looked at this in three studies. Um, so both London and Glasgow, where I used to work, has a long tradition of epidemiological research. Um, studies were, were, these studies were, um, are, no one in this room would have participated in them, I don't think. Um, but these studies were conducted in Glasgow and London, and there were studies of the general population, the Renfrew and Paisley study, and also a collaborative workplace um, cohort, um, and also conducted in, in London, Whitehall, Whitehall civil servants. And so we've got these three cohorts, two based in Scotland, one based in England, and we compare the, the mortality patterns of these groups of people over time, and we've got these background data unusually on these people that tr help us try to understand if these mortality differences are present, what might explain them. And, well, firstly, we did find markedly higher mortality rates in Scotland relative to England. For total mortality, that is mortality from any cause, we found that the higher prevalence of known risk factors, smoking, drinking, et cetera, socioeconomic status, did explain the differential. But there were still very marked differences, that's to say higher rates for stroke, accidents, and suicide in, in Scotland in these studies. Now, this was very much a first stab at trying to understand the, the so-called Scottish effect. Um, 
the, these studies were based on men only because they were conducted in the 60s and 70s when cardiovascular disease was thought only to be a problem amongst men and not women. We've generalized from some specific cohort studies in specific cities in each of these countries to the general population, which is probably um, debatable. Uh, and also the, n the number of participants in these studies. By today's standards of UK Biobank, why we have 500,000 people, the numbers of study participants is rather modest. These aren't high-resolution studies like most of you are part participated in. They're, they're quite modest in the data they're collected. So what we wanted to do, we wanted to do this on a, on a bigger scale using more representative populations. And I, th I think also we wanted to do it in much larger numbers because larger numbers are very important in ep epidemiology. They give you a lot more statistical power, a lot more confidence in what you find. And I just want to spend a couple of minutes illustrating what I mean by this. Everyone will, in this room will be aware of this association. That is that higher blood pressure is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. There'll be people in this room who are on blood pressure lowering medication. And we also know, for instance, that blood cholesterol is associated with cardiovascular disease. Higher blood cholesterol, higher risk of cardiovascular disease. And there'll be people in this room on statins. So this is a causal association. And we know it's causal because we've run studies with very big numbers. And the, uh, the kind of studies that we're talking about are cohort studies. Often, and Ian talked about it, collaboration, where you bring in a bunch of different studies, you put them into one pot, and you come up with hundreds of thousands of people. And the collaborators in Oxford have done this, and they've, ta they've said, OK, well, we've, got we've got almost a million people in our pot of studies. We've got 90 studies, almost a, a million people. Uh, what happens when we start experimenting with the numbers in this study, do we, in this collaboration? Do we get clearer results or don't we? So they started out with a very small-scale study in my discipline, and they're looking at the relationship here between blood pressure and cardiovascular disease, remember. And we know, as I described in the previous slide, that it's a positive correlation. So blood pressure increases, so does cardiovascular disease risk. And this is a small-scale cohort study, 5,000 5, people, the, the size of um, some of the smaller Framingham studies. And you can kind of see that there's a positive association, but it's not very clear. When we get into more in the Generation Scotland territory, you get greater clarity, positive association, some upturns in risk. These are stratified by age. And then if you increase the order of magnitude again by one into this sort of biobank area, you're getting a, this real clarity of association. So in our next project, where we tried to look at the differences between Scotland and England in terms of mortality, we tried to, to emulate the type of scale that we see on the right-hand side of your slide. And this was done using um, a bunch of studies collect that have been used to collect data throughout Scotland and throughout England. Uh, in in uh, Scotland, we had three studies totaling 25,000 people, and in England, we had 15 studies totaling 200,000 people. And these are the uh, health surveys for England and the Scottish health surveys. Um, a group at UCL where I'm based has been responsible for many years in taking these snapshots of health in the Scottish and English populations. And we're interested in collecting data that we can't get by routine methods. So we can't get by hospital admissions or we can't get through death data. We're interested in what kind of uh, medications people take. We're interested in measuring their blood pressure and how hard they can breathe into a tube to measure their lung function. We're, inter we're interested in data on ethnic minorities. We're interested in passive, passive smoking. You can only get these kind of results if you go out into the field. And so that's what the purpose of these studies. And then because we have in the UK this wonderful data linkage system, we've linked the study members um, prospectively to mortality records. So it's a longitudinal study of sorts, but not one where we see people on a regular basis. And uh, the, the short answer is that we found an increased risk of mortality, again in Scotland relative to England, about a 40% increase in risk. We then try to understand and explain this association by taking into account socioeconomic taste, status, smoking, alcohol consumption, self-assessed health, self health in order to get at mental health, for instance, and other long-standing illnesses. And we are only able to explain um, a relatively small proportion, about 25% about of that association. 
So in the data we've collected, we've actually been rather unsuccessful in trying to understand the difference in the mortality patterns. So then we've got on to speculate, well, what data would we have that we, that we would like to have that we didn't collect? Ian talked about all these data that you think afterwards that you would have liked to have um, collected. So why is there this differential? What data didn't we collect? And colleagues, um, David Walsh and, and Jerry McCartney have, have written a number of pieces um, on what, what could be the explanatory factors for the Scottish effect. And they've come up with, well, we came up with a collection of uh, 40. And if you're uh, really struggling to sleep at night, there's a large document you can download. Or David will happily send it, David Walsh will happily send it to you, or I will. And there's, there's around 40 different uh, reasons we came up with for this difference beyond the explanations we'd already examined empirically. And these are just some of them. We've talked earlier about, um, David Portis talked earlier about genetic vulnerability, this, the notion that there may be some genetic factors in, in Scottish folk that might um, um, uh, increase their risk of mortality relative to uh, English-born individuals. Um, that's unlikely to be an explanation because these mortality trends have been have, have turned over a relatively short period of time, probably too rapid to, to um, be explained by changes in the gene pool. They, they could be still explained by health behaviours we haven't captured. We haven't captured physical activity very well. They could be explained by substance misuse, for instance, the um, external causes of death, injury, suicide. There's also, an, uh, ov obviously, and this won't come as no surprise to anyone in the room, there are also climatic differences between England and Scotland. Uh, yeah, there's lower levels of sunlight in, the, in, in Scotland and therefore lower levels of vitamin D uh, exposure or generation, and that could be an, another explanation. So these 40 new hypotheses were put together, and um, uh, David and Jerry McCartney, who did a lot of the heavy lifting on this project, in, in, at great cost employed a graphic designer to come up with this schematic. And frankly, if someone can explain this to me, I'd be uh, very happy. Uh, and again, if you're having trouble at sleeping at night, you can download that, um, um, or I can send it to you. Um, so um, I would like to thank the various people involved in these particular projects. Um, none of them are here, so I can all say they've got great faces for radio. Um, and I will end there. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>